Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's pre presentation on physician advocacy in medicine. My name is Dr. Alden Landry. I'm the Assistant Dean for the Office for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership and an Associate Professor in Emergency Medicine here at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and I will be not only uh, introducing our panelists, but also moderating this session. Today's event is sponsored by the Office for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership, whose mission is to advance diversity uh, and inclusion in health, biomedical, behavioral, and STEM fields in ways that build individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation, and to ensure e equity in health locally, nationally, and globally. Toward this end, we support the career development of junior faculty, trainees, and students. We identify and train leaders in academic medicine and health policy and provide programs that address crucial pipeline and pathway issues. This program is part of our Equity and Social Justice Initiative Lecture Series, which is established to address issues related to health disparities, social determinants of health, leadership in, at the health system level, and health policy in other areas affecting vulnerable populations. ESJ events focus on four areas. One, historical uh, history and context. Two, culture and environment. Three, health disparities. And four, leadership and skills development. But before we get started, we're gonna have a few uh, housekeeping notes. Number one, the chat is not available and your microphones will be muted. If you would like to ask a question to our panelists, please use the Q&A to post questions to our panelists. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the DICP website. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Fiona Donaher, uh, who is a pediatrician at Massachusetts General for Children, Chair of the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital Immigrant Health Coalition, and Director of the MGH Center for Immigrant Health. She practices primary care at MGH Chelsea Pediatrics, where a substantial portion of her clinic work focuses on promoting the well-being of children and immigrant families. She has testified before Congress and the Massachusetts State Legislature regarding immigrant children's health. Uh, she works with community-based organizations and partners across disciplines, provides written and oral testimony for legislative hearings and legal filings, and uses advocacy uh, to, as a strategy to counter physician burnout. Dr. Nazrin Ibrahim is our next panelist. She is an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and she is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit, The Equity in Heart Transplant Project, a 501c3 public charity that provides financial um, assistance to patients with end-stage heart failure who need a transplant. Her research includes improving adherence to guidelines-directed uh, therapy in heart failure, the role hospital systems and health policy in dismantling uh, disparities, and improving access to heart transplantation in historically excluded and systemically oppressed patient populations. Our third and final panelist is Dr. Brittany Watson, uh, who is a dedicated family physician and assistant uh, professor in the Department of Family and Community at Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist. In addition to her academic role, she serves as the Associate Medical Director for North Carolina Mer Medicaid. Dr. Watson's early experiences in rural uh, South Carolina supporting family members and her practice in a federally qualified health center setting profoundly shaped her understanding of the crucial role of physician advocacy. So as you can see, we have three amazing panelists and I wanna jump into our first question. Um, Jorge, if you can just take down the slides, I'd appreciate that. Uh, we're gonna turn to Dr. Ibrahim. Um, and just for those of you who are joining us, please know that Dr. Ibrahim is a little bit under the weather but still push through in this webinar space to be here with us. Uh, and so I just wanna start off with a very simple question. Um, not only how did you get into this advocacy space, but why did you get into this advocacy space? I always say like the reason I do what I do is because of the stories that have traumatized me. Like I founded the Equity and Heart Transplant Project based on one story, which was my first experience with realizing how horrible the system is. I remember, when I told my brother that I wanted to be a transplant doc, he's like, why are you going to that field? Um, it's for, it's a treatment for privileged people. And that's like not your MO. And so I was at, at the University of Colorado doing my heart failure and transplant fellowship. And there was this patient that they sent over from Montana 
this young gentleman who had been in the military, but he did not have, uh, wasn't connected to the VA health system because he had a dishonorable discharge from the army because of marijuana or something in his urine. And so he only had Medicaid. So number one, Montana Medicaid is one of the few that does not cover heart transplant in adults. And then it also doesn't cover LVADs or mechanical heart pumps. So he comes in crashing and burning. They fly him to the University of Colorado. He gets put on ECMO literally on the rooftop of the hospital by the surgeons. And so he's sitting there. I remember he was my age um, and we're scrambling to figure out how are we going to get this man off of ECMO and onto like a durable heart pump or a transplant. And so um, insurance was an issue. The hospital said, okay, what we'll do is we'll do the operation for free. But once he's discharged, um, he's on his own. And so we decided, okay, we can do fundraising to help him cover the hospital visits and the co-payments. But another issue became housing. So he was um, living in a mobile home. And with the mobile home, there's this concern. Uh, we need electricity constantly because the LVAD or the heart pump uh, goes off, works off batteries. And so there was an issue with housing, unstable housing. And then the third thing is th this thing that we throw at patients all the time. It's like social support. So he was kind of a loner, um, mainly because of his mental health that he suffered because he went and served our country. Um, and so really was a uh, not didn't have a good social support system. The social workers were amazing. They went to like the church from his childhood to see if somebody would volunteer to help him. And so those big three things that always end up being the reason we turn black, brown, low income refugee patients out, like, you know, don't list them for transplant became, you know, the reason I was like, okay, we got to do something about this. And it wasn't just his story. His first, his story was the first to traumatize me because eventually I had to go in as the fellow and say, you know, we were going to let you die essentially based on a few thousand dollars. And so, um, you know, it just kept getting re-traumatized with all the stories throughout that had haunted me. And it was always black patients. It was always brown patients. It was always patients that looked like me. And just because I was lucky to not end up like them, we essentially let them die. And so I said, uh, I'm not going to stay part of the system that is like so horrible and so inequitable. And so I founded the Equity and Heart Transplant Project. And we do exactly that. We um, provide financial assistance where we address social and financial barriers. Like we address housing, we address childcare. Cause if you can imagine, like if I need a heart transplant and say I'm married and we have two kids or whatever, my husband, we're asking him to stay home for six months to take care of me. So who's going to watch the kids and childcare is like ridiculously expensive. So we've paid for childcare. Uh, we've paid for insurance. We just wrote a check today to a man um, lost his job. So we bought him insurance for a year uh, which we think a year is enough to recover and then go on to work. So we bought him insurance. I talked to like the CEO of the hospital and we ended up having them pay half of it and we paid half and we got him insurance. And so since September, 2022, we've helped um, today, uh, wrote the 30th check to help a patient get listed for transplant. And so it's really the stories. And I feel like you need to take those things that have traumatized you and put your energy into um, a way to help them because the government's not going to help them, right? You just have to surround yourself by similar minded people that are willing to uh, keep pushing um, to support you in this like crazy venture or idea that you might have. So I, I, I thank you for sharing that story. And I think it really sort of sets the groundwork because I think a lot of physicians move into the space around advocacy because of those patient stories and those experiences that we have taking care of patients, um, interacting with families, recognizing um, the shortcomings of our system. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is, um, you know, the three of us are all practicing physicians. Um, or excuse me, the four of us on this panel are all practicing physicians. And the three of you in this advocacy space um, have all kept a foot in your clinical practice while still doing the work that you do uh, to support the communities um, through your advocacy work. Can you talk a little bit about why it's important for physicians sort of to maintain that space both in the clinical realm as well as in their advocacy space? I mean, I went to medicine to take care of people and I love people. I thrive on people. The pandemic really messed me up. I hate virtual visits. So I get my energy from being around people. And so I see, like when I look around and I see some of these physicians who are incredible and had incredible careers, specifically in cardiology, and they're now like CEOs of these pharma companies, I feel like you forget. You forget what it's like to be 
boots on the ground, hearing these patient stories and, you know, trying to figure out ways to help them. So I, I personally love patient care. I hate all of the paperwork and bureaucracy that goes into taking care of patients that they've, you know, they've taken so much away from us from just having that physician patient relationship. But I also feel like it keeps you grounded and then the stories don't stop. And so I get my energy from people, but also when I get to meet the patients that we've helped or the patients that are like, Hey, I am a CEO of, I used to be CEO of United Airlines. I didn't know that because of my privilege, no one asked me what I had in my bank account. And so you get to tell, influence people by saying, hey, you're lucky you got a heart transplant. Not everybody is. And then people just want to support. So that's why I uh, probably won't ever give up clinical medicine. I'll probably do less of it, but I won't give it up. So along those lines, I think it's important for us to sort of acknowledge the fact that you are sort of putting yourself out there in a space that can be um, very difficult to navigate. Um, there's a big learning curve because we don't taught this in medical school. Um, and when you go through residency, uh, the expectation is on clinical excellence, not necessarily on understanding and developing um, your skills as um, a leader. Um, can you talk about sort of what pieces came into play uh, to help you to start your 501c3, uh, why you chose this model, and then what are some of, uh, and before I add more questions to that, I'll just start with that. So how, what skills did you have to obtain along the way? How did you obtain those? And what led to the 501c3 that you started? So I knew that I had to help and it was um, on in, on February 17th, 2022, my childhood best friend died suddenly. Like we still don't know why she died. She was living in Egypt at the time and she died and she left behind two young kids and her death, like in the middle of the pandemic made me say, oh my God, I need to stop thinking and start doing. So I spent a year reading about different models I could do. And one of them was like a foundation, like I can create a foundation in my family's name, but the problem there is um, anybody that donates to the foundation would not get a tax break. And let's face it, everybody's always looking out for themselves and people like tax breaks. And so the other model was the 501c3, where I can get partnerships with like industry, with individual donors and have them donate. So I spent a year essentially reading all these books about 501c3s. And a lot of them were saying, you should just partner with another 501c3 charity and not create your own because it's hard to be successful. And I was determined, like, because I'm stubborn, so I spent like a year learning. I took all these like free webinars. I joined some courses. I told people what I was doing. So randomly people were connecting me to like, hey, my mom runs a nonprofit that helps educate women in Pakistan. So I ended up meeting people and then I uh, saved enough money, sat down with an attorney in Massachusetts and set up the 501c3. And I keep telling everybody, I'm learning as we do this because now people are coming to me and saying, teach me what you're doing. And I'm like, dude, I literally just, I'm teaching myself. And if you, uh, the most important part was to build a team around me of people who A, have skills, you know, different than mine and um, complement my skill set, uh, people who hold me accountable. And then absolutely like people who call me out on my shit because there's not many people who do that. Oh my God, this is recorded. I'm sorry. But I needed uh, to have those kind of people that call me out when I'm like, you know, feeling so emotional and I want to give away all of our money. You can't do that, right? We have to decide. And then one important thing in this giving space is we had this phenomenal meeting with Arthur Kaplan. He's like a world famous bioethicist um, at NYU who um, has a special interest in transplant. So we met with him early on to discuss things like distribution of a scarce resource because I haven't met my billion dollar donor yet, but if we have say 10 applicants and they each need $2,000 versus one who might be 36 and with four children, but she needs or he needs $10,000, do we give him or her the 10,000 or do we help the other you know, five people that only need 2,000? So the ethical piece, I hadn't thought of that until we started making these um, difficult decisions. And also I made sure to include people on my board that were not connected to medicine. Cause I think the problem with physicians is like, we get lost in this like physician bubble and we don't see the world outside. So I have people on there who are teachers, lawyers, um, the good kind of lawyers. Um, I have students because I think we need to teach the next generation to give and to be like generous and like you don't need to die with a billion dollars, right? Like just help the world. So I actually have college students um, that volunteer on my team. So that's how I did it. I'm still learning as I grow, but it's amazing uh, what you can do when you get the right people supporting you. 
So thank you for that. And I actually have a few questions that I'll save towards the end, because I'd love to hear more about um, the nonprofit world. I think it's a treacherous place that a lot of physicians turn to relatively quickly, thinking this will be the solution. But I also think there's limitations on the work that we can do from a um, 501c3 nonprofit standpoint. Um, and there may be other ways for us to be more influential as we take other directions, whether it be leadership roles within government or within foundations that are actually giving the money as opposed to uh, nonprofits, which are typically seeking the money. So uh, I'll come Can back I say to- say one last thing, one last sure. thing that ties to what you're about to say. So Georgia Medicaid does not cover heart transplant in adults. And so nine out of the 30 patients we've helped have been young black men in Georgia. And so we're taking it now to an advocacy policy standpoint. And we have a meeting with uh, Georgia legislators in February to present this data and say, uh, look, we're giving you all money to transplant these young patients, and it will probably save you money to just cover transplant as opposed to these readmissions for heart failure and transplant. So sorry, um, just wanted to add that. No, that's perfect. And I think, you know, when I talk, turn to Dr. Watson um, towards the end or uh, with Dr. Donaher, who's about to, br uh, I'm about to bring up, um, I think having these conversations about sharing the stories, bringing that narrative and engaging with those individuals who are in those policy spaces who, you know, are the ones that are writing what uh, policies are enacted and then enforcing those policies. I think this is the conversation that we should be having. Uh, so I'll turn to you, Dr. Donaher. How did you get involved in your advocacy work? Um, yeah, no, I mean, it was really um, uh, affirming to hear what Dr. Ibrahim was just saying, because I, I agree wholeheartedly. It's really about finding, channeling your rage, honestly. Um, we all have it, right? Like we are all witnessing injustices in our work. Um, and there, there are plenty of them. And so you kind of have to pick the one that, that really drives you. Um, in my case, um, you know, I, I grew up in a, um, a family where a lot of people had rather thick accents and I didn't think that much of it at the time because I was a kid. Um, that was just who they were. Um, and um, it wasn't until I was about 12 years old that I had a couple of really formative experiences that that changed the way I look at things. Um, my, um, I was visiting my grandfather and he um, had a pile of mail on the counter and um, I noticed that everything was addressed to H. Peter Summers. And I was like, grandpa, what's the age for? Um, cause I always knew it was Peter. Um, and he, um, said, oh, it's, it's Hans, but you know, that's my uncle's name. He was a black sheep. I don't, I don't really want to talk about it. I thought that was the end of it until a few weeks later, I got a, um, you know, five page double-sided handwritten letter from him saying, I know you were asking about my first name, but I actually need to tell you about our last name. Um, and it turned out that, um, while I knew him as Summers and that was the name that I was born with, he was actually born Solnitz, um, and came to the United States as a refugee from Germany. And I never wanted to talk about it, um, for reasons that I think are pretty obvious. Um, but, um, you know, so that was pretty eye opening for me. And then not long after that, I was visiting, um, family in the UK with my mother, who's an immigrant from Scotland. Um, and we were getting on a plane to come home, um, and we got to the check-in counter and they told her that her paperwork wasn't in order and she couldn't get on the plane. Um, and so my brother flew back to the United States, um, alone. And I remember looking out the window at the ocean and thinking like, how is it possible that a single piece of paper can separate kids from their parent by an ocean? Like that's insane. Um, Fast forward to um, my pediatric residency, um, I got placed in um, a, a clinic at MGH Chelsea, where I still work, um, because I spoke some Spanish. Um, and I was um, here in 2014, 2015, when we started to have a lot of unaccompanied kids um, coming across the border to reunite with family members here, who in some cases they hadn't seen for many, many years. Um, and it was um, so eye-opening um, and such a privilege to um, be able to hear from them about their journeys here and um, to learn about the reasons that they made this difficult trip um, and to um, watch them grow as they as they settled in here. Um, and, um, you know, so many of them have gone on to become um, successful adults and um, have demonstrated such remarkable resilience. So, um, you know, fast forward again to 2018, um, and all of a sudden we were seeing these really awful policies at the border, um, including the family separation policy. Um, and these were kids who were exactly like my patients, um, and I was pissed. <laughs> um, so um, I sat down one morning and um, 
wrote out what seemed like an angry screed to me at the time um, about everything I thought was wrong with us. And I showed it to my boss when I came into work the next day because I didn't know what else to do with it. Um, and she said, um, you know, do you mind if I show this to somebody? And I was like, okay. Um, and she actually sent it to an editor at the New England Journal of Medicine. And they must have been looking for a piece about this issue because within a week it was printed. Um, and about two weeks after that, I was out at a lake with my kids and I should have been watching my kids, but I looked at my phone um, and got an email from an address I didn't recognize from somebody at Lawyers for Civil Rights. Um, and they said, um, we are in the process of suing Attorney General Jeff Sessions um, in the case of a mother who's been separated from her son. Um, and we are looking for a physician's declaration um, uh, stating the harms of this practice from a medical and psychological standpoint for children. And we need it by Monday. <laughs> um, and my husband was like, you're insane. Um, but I said, they had me at their suing Jeff Sessions. So um, I, I banged out this declaration. They provided me with a template um, and the case went to court and um, they must not have wanted to set a precedent that would have um, forced them to end the policy because within 24 hours of the court hearing, the child was released to his mother. Um, and so that was my introduction to physician advocacy and how powerful it can be. Um, and after that, I was hooked. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I started um, working with um, the mass chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and with um, other community organizations like the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, um, and basically just um, offering my um, skills and experience and expertise to them and saying, you know, you tell me what you need, um, and that's what I will do, and that's where I will go. Um, and I think that um, that's really important for us as um, as physicians, um, I think, as Dr. Ibrahim was saying, to recognize that we have our bubble and we might think we know what's needed. Um, uh, but the reality is that the people um, out there in the community who are doing the work are the ones who can point us in the right direction. And we just need to let them plug us in. Um, so I know I just rambled a lot. Um, I'll stop. <laughs> No, I, I appreciate that. And I actually got, you know, a little fire inside of me when I heard your story. And, um, you know, I love how you are ready to take on the uh, Attorney General of the United States um, because of their policies. And I think a lot of us find that sort of um, passion um, because of either the personal experience, which you brought in talking about your mother or uh, the professional experience, um, because we see this on a day in and day out basis. Well, Dr. Ibrahim, fortunately, has not needed a heart transplant. She saw that in the need of our patients, and you brought both the personal and professional component to that. And so I guess to, to, to really tie into that question is, what is the best way to plug in your clinical expertise on the issues that you care about the most? Yeah, I mean... Um... I think there are a lot of different levels at which we can advocate um, and, you know, how you go about it really depends on what your bandwidth is. Um, but you can advocate within your own institution um, for changes to policies and practices that are going to better serve your patients. Um, you can advocate at the, um, the legislative level and the bar to do that is very low. I think people think that they have to be like a super specialized expert um, in order for um, anybody to want to hear what they have to say. And that is not true. Um, it's um, not that common for physicians to be able to make the time to show up at legislative hearings. And so when they do, people listen. Um, I, um, uh, you know, one of my very first state house hearings, um, I, I tagged along with a mass chapter of the AAP um, and I was two months postpartum, I wore my son throughout my testimony. Nobody cared. Um, so like, don't, don't let these barriers get in your way. Um, your testimony will be welcomed, um, however you come. Um, and, um, you know, at the federal and state level, um, you know, your advocacy can look like writing letters. It can look like, um, working with organizations and, and, um, uh, asking them what they need from you. It can look like, um, uh, submitting um, public comments. Um, it can look like testifying. Like there are so many different things you can do. So um, I really just encourage people to um, to look around to the organizations that are doing the work. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, they will be thrilled to have you. So along that lines, because I think this is a really interesting point that you just made about sort of the need for us as uh, physicians to bring our expertise into spaces um, that often don't have a clinical lens or anyone who is representing the voice of either um, the providers or the patients in these rooms. And so, you know, as we talk about, yeah, I, I also hear the fact that 
I'll, I'll be honest with you, a lot of physicians that I know um, would shake in the fact that they would have to sit in front of um, individuals, either it be um, you know, government officials or those elected individuals um, and bringing forward testimony. And I think a lot of us just have to overcome that level of discomfort. And so as you think about sort of taking that step, how would you encourage people to sort of one, shake off that nervousness that may come, up, come along with this? Um, and then also too, just how do we get involved in a legislative advocacy process? I think for for me, I wouldn't even know how to reach out to um, you know the the state legislature um, to say I want to come and testify. So how does that how does that process come into play? Okay, yeah. So um, I think that it is. Um, I don't know if it, maybe just go along and watch a state house hearing before testifying because honestly, some of the people who show up to testify. Um, I, uh, are just there to rant and don't have any expertise in anything. Um, it's really a low bar to get in the door. Um, and so um, uh, hopefully people will feel more comfortable um, if they have seen that. Um, the other thing I will say is that um, the most powerful hearings I have been to are the ones where the patients or the people directly affected are speaking um, and where my role has really just been to validate what they're saying. Um, so like to give you one example, um, the first time I testified in Congress, which you have to be invited there, um, you can't just show up. <laughs> um, I don't know how I got that invitation. Regardless, um, my job there was, um, this was a, a, a hearing about medical deferred action, which was a, um, is a, um, an option that USCIS can exercise when um, immigrants are slated for deportation potentially, but have significant medical issues that they couldn't get adequately treated in their home countries, they can make a case to stay in the United States to receive their medical care. Um, and in 2019, um, the previous administration quietly attempted to end that option. Um, and it was only because of a um, local um, legal organization, a phenomenal group called Rian, who noticed that their clients were all suddenly getting denials and raised the alarm to the media and to um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Um, she called a congressional hearing and um, I was able to participate alongside um, a, a lawyer, two lawyers, and a couple of patients, um, Maria Isabel um, Bueso Barrera and um, Jonathan Sanchez. Jonathan was only 16 at the time. He has cystic fibrosis and he was coughing throughout that entire hearing. Um, and Maria has um, MPS6. Um, it's a, um, a genetic condition that has her in a wheelchair. Um, and um, these two young people were such powerful, powerful speakers about their own um, medical conditions and what it would mean for them to be deported. And my job was just to stand there and say, yes, what they're saying is accurate. They cannot get the care they need in their home countries. And if you do this, people will die. Um, very easy. Um, and there was not a single legislator on that um, panel who could look those two in the face and tell them that they deserved um, that fate. Um, and so it was, it was actually a very easy experience for me. Um, that has not been the case in hearings where I have shown up and the families have not been able to be present. Um, I, I did a second congressional hearing about the deaths of two children in Customs and Border Protection custody, um, and the families had already been deported. They weren't there to share their side of the story, and it was awful um, because there were legislators who were blaming the families for the deaths of their children in U.S. custody. Um, Congresswoman Presley likes to say that the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. Um, and that, I think, is really at the heart of how you um, advocate effectively. Um, if you can't have your patients there with you, um, obviously it is scary for people. You know, in my work, a lot of folks are undocumented. The idea of walking into a government building is anathema to um, anything they would consider. Um, then how do you bring those powerful stories to bear? Um, because you can bring all the data you want and the data is important, um, but what sticks with people in their hearts and minds is the stories. Um, and so, you know, come armed with those stories, well de-identified, of course. Um, but um, I think when you are sharing um, truth that is that raw, um, you'll be okay. Um, you know, that's all I can say. <laughs> No, thank you for that. I think, you know, first, I love that quote by uh, Congresswoman uh, Presley, and I think it's really important that we sort of think about how do we bring the voices who are suffering the most uh, into the spaces so that they can, you know, be in front of and, and engage with 
uh, the policymakers um, and have them answer directly to them. Uh, so I think that is uh, just such a powerful quote. I think just one last question before I turn to Dr. Watson. Um, this is something that happens to um, physicians and we're talking about it more, uh, but I wanna to come to you and to have this discussion around burnout. Um, how do we um, recognizing that, you know, there is a lot of um, trauma that comes along with this um, and uh, recognizing that this is um, something that can be draining um, coming up, telling these stories, doing this work, uh, because it's a heavy lift and it's often an unsupported lift. Uh, how do you mitigate uh, the burnout that may potentially come along with the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I would say that honestly, advocacy is kind of my antidote to burnout um, because I get really tired of putting band-aids on the same wounds over and over and over again. Um, and it feels very empowering to go to the source and try to prevent those wounds from happening in the first place or to heal those wounds. Um, you know, I, I get tired as a pediatrician hearing these terrible stories um, about children who have been through horrible experiences just trying to reunite with their family members. Um, I get really um, tired um, hearing about the fear that my patients experience when they're worried about deportation. Um, and um, I can I can sit in the exam room and hear the same story over and over and over again, um, or I can get out there and, and try to do something about it. And so um, advocacy can be very tiring. It can be very discouraging. The um, arc of the legislative process is extremely long. In Massachusetts, every legislative session is two years, um, and it can take many legislative sessions before a bill finally gets passed. Um, it's very helpful to find mentors in this space um, who can help you have realistic expectations about what it's going to take and how long it's going to take, um, because you will flame out if you if you show up and expect things to change right away. Um, but, um, you know, if you come at it with that kind of support and you find your people, um, it can really be sustaining work. You know, as you were saying that, and I was thinking about how long some of this work actually takes, because sometimes you're cycling through elected officials, and that can be anywhere from two to four to six years, um, depending on uh, at what level we're talking about. Um, we're talking about laws that have to be put in place, um, and then the policies have to be written based off of the laws in order to have that change. And so I think you're right, actually, in, in this process, we think, oh, if we do this work now, the change will happen tomorrow. And the reality this is a long drawn out process. And I think you have to not only pace yourself as you approach this work, but understand that sometimes your changes um, are not gonna be earth shaking, but they're gonna be incremental. And um, you have to look to um, find the strength in those small victories, knowing that um, the quote from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is the arc, uh, the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think we're all in this space thinking about how do we do our work to get that arc to move a little bit towards uh, justice more and more each day. So thank you for that. Uh, I want to turn now to you, uh, Dr. Watson. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your patience uh, as we come to you. Um, same story to start off. Um, how did you get involved in this space and what led to you being uh, engaged in advocacy work? Well, so for me, it's pretty much all of my life experiences. I'm from the middle of nowhere, rural South Carolina, where there are a lot of health inequities. I, and at that time growing up, I didn't have the vocabulary of health disparities or social drivers of health. I just knew that I was watching my mom struggle to take care of my grandmother with Alzheimer's and who'd had several strokes, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, and there were limited resources. I knew that I had family members who had heart attacks or strokes, and it took hours for EMS to arrive to the rural area. Um, so I knew I wanted to go into medicine to have an impact in that space and particularly primary care because I was just interested in so many things and that's still how it is today. And then as I like progressed through my career working um, in the community health center setting, I started hearing these patient stories, you know, and in, particularly in an under-resourced area, they start to really hit home. I can remember I had a middle-aged man come to me, oh, to establish care for high blood pressure. And he happened to mention that he had some sort of biopsy procedure maybe about a year ago um, in the local hospital. And I just assumed that if the biopsy was positive for something, that 
there may there should have been follow up. So for some reason, I don't know what made me look, but I ended up looking um at the chart, even though he didn't have any concerns about that, but he had lung cancer. So and they knew about it a year prior. But the effort was not put into locating this um this man who has this life threatening, you know, malignancy going on and God knows like how long um he had been having issues prior to that biopsy. So now you have a person that you were establishing care with who you thought you were just having blood pressure issues come in and tell you that you're having cancer and then you don't have health insurance. So now it's on in your inner state that has not expanded Medicaid. So you have to work to try to navigate that process. And I've had patients come to me, for example, a woman who uh, felt a lump. She felt a lump a year before, but did not seek care because she was nervous about the cost. She said she felt like it was cancer, but she knew she couldn't pay for it. And I asked her what made her come to see me that day. And it was because a friend had told her about the sliding scale um, program at the FQHC so that she could afford that. And she came in to see me. So seeing those um, patients and having those experiences taught me that it's important to listen to folks and see what's going on on the ground. And that kind of navigates where I place my efforts and my interests because we are talking about advocacy on a large scale right now. Um, but I think sometimes it's important to remember that advocacy can be within a, within a advocating for a patient, within a clinic, within a community, um, because that is where it starts and you get your foundation and then you kind of branch out. And that's kind of how I got into um, the work that I'm doing. And what I think is great about the three of you all as panelists is we're all coming at this, you all are all coming at this from different perspectives, still centering on the patient, right? That's the ultimate goal is how do we make sure that our patients have the best outcomes, but we're coming at it from different um, vantage points in the way that we approach this work. Um, but for you in particular, um, Dr. Watson, uh, you are in, as you stated, the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, and oftentimes, you know, we think of these as big city issues. We think of healthcare as being in these academic medical centers, but you um, are a part of an FQHC. That's where your work's been based. Um, with FQHCs, we know that they are already under-resourced. We know that you are already in a position where your time is going to be limited because of the expectation to see a certain amount of patients. And so how do you balance, and well, first off, how do you make space to do your advocacy work? And then how do you have that balance uh, so that you can continue to do that work often in an under-resourced setting? So that is that balance is something that I'm actively trying to, to work on, to be quite honest and transparent, because time is very scarce and very precious, especially in primary care. You have 15 minutes to spend with an individual that has all these other things going on. Um, but the way I look at it is that the few minutes that I spend with the patient, we know that healthcare uh, accounts for what, you know, 10 to 20% of someone's overall health outcome. The patient spends a few minutes with me and they go out into the world. So I feel like I'm wasting my time in the few minutes that I have with them if I am not also doing the work to impact the conditions that they're living in. And to, for example, even small things like pushing for patient access, like it may take me 20 minutes to get a patient referred to a specialist because again, whenever you're in a state that has expanded Medicaid, it's a, it's a little bit more difficult to get patients um, the resources that they need or a medication. I find that me taking that time makes a difference in the long run. So it's an investment. So along those lines, you're you're talking about investing in your patients, but you as a physician also need to stay abreast as to sort of the policy changes that are happening. Um, oftentimes that don't filter down to us because we're invested in our patient care. We're taking care of, you know, we're learning about new medications. We're learning about new therapies. We're learning about new interventions, but we're also being pushed in different directions by the policies that are coming into play. So how do you stay up to date on those policies and how do you make sure that not only you stay up to date, but the physicians around you, the other parts of the healthcare team stay aware? And then also, how do you get that information to the patients? Well, actually, one of the things that uh, happens sometimes is patients will bring me things, which is it is rare. But again, it goes back to like listening to um, folks because they saw something on Facebook and nine times out of 10 is something 
totally left field, but you know, I, I look into it. Um, but one of the things, especially in a local setting, is like the local news outlets. And they're struggling these days, but these organizations really do a, a phenomenal job of shining the light on issues that are really close to home and that directly impact the community. So I the local newspaper, local news websites, I also listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, mostly because I'm interested in this stuff. So um I sign up for health policy newsletters and email that I get also like the professional organizations. I heard you mention the AAP. So I'm a member of the AAFP and these professional organizations that I belong to, they send out information periodically, especially in regards to even things that um, are not directly patient related, but professionally like things that impact how we practice medicine, which ultimately impacts patients as well. But these organizations do a really good job at summarizing things um, and passing it down um, in a digestible way. Um, yeah, and I think for a lot of us, our professional organizations uh, can be a, a, a strength um, in the work that we're doing as far as keeping us abreast of what's, as to what's going on. Um, you know, for for you, how do you feel that you are most effective in um, policy changes? How do you feel as if you can be uh, the most impactful, aside from communicating with your patients? But what do you think is the place where you you have the most leverage? Ooh, the most leverage. That's that's pretty hard. I would say physicians are like the second most trusted profession um, behind nurses, and just your voice, your presence, showing up in spaces can make a difference, um, in my opinion. Um, whenever you write something that shines light on an issue that may not have seen light, you know, I, we, we like to say that every voice matters, which I believe that, but my experience in life shows me that that's not necessarily true. Some voices are valued more than others. And whenever you are a physician and you have that, like I mentioned, you have this professional title that, is deemed to be trustworthy, I think it's important to, for at least for me, to use that position to uplift those other voices that may be ignored. And I just wanna say that Brittany is both, used to be a nurse and now is a physician, so you're extra trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to double dip on the trustworthiness. Right, and right. The case. <laughs> So I, I have a question that, uh, first off, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. Um, and I'm going to start to open this conversation up to uh, questions from the audience. So uh, as mentioned earlier, um, please use the Q&A function to ask questions for our panelists. Um, but I actually want to try and take a couple of the questions that I know were submitted beforehand and, and incorporate that into our conversation. Um, and one is around social media, uh, which I think has definitely been a blessing and a curse. Um, and I think it has allowed physicians to be more um, visible, um, but it also comes with a lot of pitfalls. And so I will turn this over to you all. I'll, I'll start with uh, you, Fiona, and then Nazra and I, I know you've had some recent experiences, so I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. I don't have that much to say about social media because I'm a total Luddite and that is a big weakness in my advocacy work. Um, I I let the organizations that are leading the charge on this handle it and I, I do their bidding. Um, so I'll pass it to the other speakers. So I love social media. It can be horrible, but it can also be amazing to spread the word and raise awareness. But also it's a very dangerous place. So it just depends on your risk tolerance. You know, people are going to find anything to be mad about. Like, for example, a few months ago, I put up this chart of the number of people we've helped. I think we were at 17 at the time and two of them were women and 15 were men. These people were coming after me like you've only helped two women. How is this equitable? And then don't be like me. I tell my mentees, don't be like me. I like went in on some people on social media and then I blocked them. But you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't engage. And so there's trolls. They're going to come after you uh, with my recent advocacy with the current events. Um, I've had like probably the worst type of uh, harassment and bullying. I was doxxed on social media. Some guy got my cell phone number. And so they were upset about what I was talking about with the current situation in the Middle East and doxxed my number. I was getting like hate messages on WhatsApp, my um just like text messages, iMessages. They were calling me nonstop. And the problem is I was on call. And so I couldn't turn my phone off. I got death threats through my website, like Boston police, FBI, like hate crime, civil rights units got involved, Brigham police. I have a safety plan. Like I can't walk home at night. 
uh, for like the last two months, I have to go home with a police escort because the death threats are real. They installed um, a panic button in my office. They do extra patrols because my office is like where the administrative offices are. I'm not an administrator, but it's very far from everything else. So especially like for the holiday season, those guys don't work for the holidays, but I'm on call. They're going to do extra patrols. So it's traumatizing. It's stressful. Um, there's people trying to shut down my nonprofit. Um, they actually have emailed board members saying that I'm anti-Semitic and that they should leave my nonprofit. They emailed the editor in chief of the journal that I'm the, an associate editor on to get me off. So it's really not without um, trauma, especially for this specific thing that I'm advocating for, but people will find something. But again, I'm not stopping. I have, I had to go back to therapy to help with my anxiety because I wasn't really scared until the police made me scared and did all these like safety measures. And then you take breaks and you find your people. There's like an MGB support group for this specific situation that has over 200 physicians and we're, we back each other up. And so you have to take breaks. Like if you want to keep going and the, I was talking to one of my best friends, she's at Indiana university. Her name is Khadija Brethet. She's a tenured professor there. And she does a lot of work in the equity space in cardiology and in transplant. And she's like, we're, we just advocate different. Like I want to be in the streets at the protests and she writes papers and she presents to, in front of Congress. You just have to decide which way you're going and what your risk tolerance is, but know that social media is a breeding ground for like trolls and bullies and just, you know, what your style is. And I was told like at Harvard, I was told years ago when I first joined faculty at MGH that if you look around, like Harvard people are quiet. And I was like, that's never going to be me. Like that doesn't work for me. <laughs> so depends on your risk tolerance, what you want to do. Um, I say this jokingly, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, as long as I've known you, you've never been quiet. So I think that is uh, something that is definitely a strength for your patients as well uh, in the communities that you try and help. Uh, Dr. Watson, I want to turn to you. Um, and you may have a response to that question, but uh, I wanted to ask you a question more about you know, when people can sort of take, carry on this mantle of advocacy. Um, we have medical students that are interested in this space, pre-health students that are interested in this space, um, and then also residents, whether they be interns or, um, you know, senior residents. People are, you know, have these experiences, they have these interactions with patients, and it lights a fire in them. How do you encourage people to think about where to be, in fact, uh, impactful, at what stage, and um, to what degree, especially when they're in those vulnerable spaces, especially as a trainee, uh, when there probably are some repercussions that can come into play uh, based on everything that they're they're involved in. Yeah, first I was just gonna say how much I admire um, Dr. Abraham because we've talked about this and even though, and this goes to one of my first things, like using social media as a in a, in a positive light to shine light on things, well, she talked a lot about the negative stuff, but I can see just like how strong she has been throughout this process and how more aligned with her purpose she is in this whole throughout this whole ordeal. And it's really lit a fire under her and she's not going to stop. And I think that being on the right side of these issues are like going to be important in the long term. So much respect um, to that. So using you know, as a intern, students, met um, residents, like we, a lot of them are on social media. So I think doing that is is uh, is helpful. Also, like starting small. So like you mentioned in training, the main thing that you're doing is like learning how to take care of patients, and that can be like, all consuming. But finding things that fill your cup. So you know, volunteering with a community group, um, starting there, learning more about the area that you're in. Because one of the things that I think sometimes we um, we do is we see an issue and we try to go in and fix it because that's what we do as physicians. We want to fix. But oftentimes that's not necessarily what we think the community needs is not necessarily what they want from us or what they actually need. So getting more involved uh, will help in that process. You're on mute, Dr. Oh, Landry. I'm sorry. Do you, Fiona, did you want to um, add to that? I think it's really important to, for us to hear, you know, how how and when and why people can get involved and in what stages and what levels they can be of, of resource. Yeah, um, I mean, I remember um, I, I've I've always been um, uh, similar to, to Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Um, Watson. I think I've always had a little bit of a fire under me and wanted to get involved in things. And I think when we're um, in college and med school, we kind of just 
want to do all of the things um, and um, have all of these ideas. And um, it's um, really important. Really, I, I've said this a number of times, but like find the other people doing the work and plug yourself into it. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, you'll get so much farther if you do it that way. Um, I think that um, your you know, professional credibility will increase the longer that you are doing the work and the farther that you are in your training. But there are so many really important things that you can do no matter where you are in, in your trajectory. Um, and I think um, the, the direct advocacy that you can do with your patients um, is in some ways um, a really unique strength that trainees have um, because um, medical students in particular um, and maybe to a lesser extent residents um, are given or, or spend a lot of time with their patients um, and um, are at the bedside more than the attendings are and really um, get to know what's at the heart of um, what's underlying their patient's presentations. Um, and so um, I would just say like really listen and use those opportunities um, because what you learn from your patients in your training is what will guide your advocacy for the rest of your career. Um, you know, I, I got my start in this work as a resident. That is where I really learned um, what my patients needed and, and where I needed to go. Um, and so just, you know, use these opportunities to, um, to, to learn and explore um, where you could take um, your advocacy. And I, I'm going to take my um, moderator hat off for a second and just to um, opine in this. Um, because one thing I do is I, I advise and I mentor a lot of students along their journey and even uh, young professionals along their journey. And I think there's something to be said about keep, keeping um, an iron in the fire, staying interested, staying motivated um, and engaging, but also at every step of the way, uh, thinking about how you can be more and more engaged in advocacy um, with the caveat that um as a physician, you are likely going to have a bigger platform than you are as someone who is in medical school. And because of your advocacy work, you struggle um, from a professional growth and development standpoint. And so I think it's important that you have to recognize the space that you're in uh, and be productive and meet those expectations uh, that are set for you so that you can become the physician that you're planning to be when you're in residency, become the clinician uh, that you're planning to be um, so that you can use that new and bigger platform uh, to have a bigger voice in this space. Uh, we do have a question from the audience and it's uh, for you, Dr. Ibrahim. Um, it's a relatively long question, so I'll try and abbreviate. In your experience, in what ways have you observed advocacy positively influencing patient outcomes within your medical practice? So, I mean, the the change is that 30 people who are going to be left to die based on an average of $4,000 got a transplant. And these include undocumented immigrants, both in Massachusetts, because Massachusetts Medicaid covers undocumented immigrants under emergency situations. So when they come in crashing and burning, we can transplant them. But once they leave the hospital, we have helped those patients with all the payments. Uh, and in California, you... Uh, under all circumstances, undocumented immigrants get on Medicaid. So we've helped people. It's like direct um, patients that have been saved. But within the institution, uh, bringing up at transplant selection meetings, um, how do we present patients in a more respectable way and only talk about the things that matter? Because you don't understand like the, the things people say and just influence everybody in the room. Like I remember we were sitting in a transplant selection meeting at one of the centers I was in, and it's not in Boston. And they said, uh, a social worker said, well, the caregiver of Mr. So-and-so was incarcerated 10 years ago on drug charges. And I was like, what does that have to do with anything right now? This caregiver who is the uncle has literally been in the CCU every day that I've been rounding, asks like amazing questions, has a whole notebook full of what he's supposed to do. So when you're in the room and you say something like that, all these people, you know, who might have a very different background than us or the patient are like, oh, you know, you might go back to prison and not be available to be a caregiver. So yes, we've changed the places I've been in. We've changed how we present patients and present them how you would want your like family member or yourself to be presented. It's literally so intense and who's sitting in the room. It's, a, it's like a black box. We don't talk about what happens and why people are turned down in details. And so, uh, yes, like speaking up, like the way I live my life in every place that you're in, like every room that I'm in, and I've been given a privilege, 
speak up for the most vulnerable person. If it's on rounds and the med student is getting treated like crap by, sorry, the surgeon, then say something. And so advocacy is not necessarily you're going to be John Lewis, you know, doing a sit in or, you know, marching. It could just literally be speaking up for the med student that's getting bullied by an attending. And so um, that's just how I've done things. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so I recognize that we're coming towards the end of time. And I want to say again, thank you to our panelists, uh, to the audience for joining us. Uh, and I want to ask each of you one very quick piece of advice that you have for anybody uh, listening to this, um, to um, students, trainees, um, junior faculty, or even senior faculty who may be joining us, um, a piece of advice about being more engaged in the work around advocacy as a physician. Uh, so I'll turn to you first, Fiona. Gosh, one piece of advice. Uh, <laughs> um, I think just, you know, start small and start where you're at. Um, and, and really you can't, you can't boil the sea, right? Like focus on the one issue that um, is nearest and dearest to you that really um, motivates you um, and find other people who are doing that work and ask them what you, they think you should do. Um, and, and, you know, take it one step at a time. Um, for some people, advocacy becomes like a huge defining aspect of their work. And for other people, it's a small thing that they do on the side, but it helps to keep them sane. So um, all, all levels of advocacy are valid and important. And um, just dip your toe in the water and see where it takes you. Thank you for that. Uh, Brittany? So you took a lot of mine. So one, I'll say, just listen, um, show up, be in the room, because just by being in the room sometimes opens the doors um, to different opportunities to, to impact change. Uh, and Nazarin, last but not least. So I always end with one slide and it says, find something you're mad about and fix it. And that's my advice. I love it. Um, I want to say thank you on the back end to... Um, uh, Jorge Fortin for um, helping us to execute this webinar successfully to uh, Lynn Fulton John, um, who also was part of the programming and to the Equity and Social Justice uh, Committee and to our panelists, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Watson and Dr. Donaher. Thank you for being here. Uh, we will have uh, a short um, survey that may pop up on the screen. Uh, we are planning some future equity and social uh, social justice discussions uh, that we want you all to be a part of. Uh, so please uh, be on the lookout for those. And we wish everyone uh, a safe uh, and healthy end of the year. Uh, thank you all for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Bye.